All right, friends and neighbors, those of you on this certification journey with me, uh, as you know, we are kicking off with CCNA, and more formally, that's known as the CCNA 200-301. Now, it turns out that this particular certification comes with uh, two books, a volume one and a volume two, so that's what I ordered, and we're going to start with chapter one, and we'll talk a a little bit about getting started here, some resources and things like that. Uh, so I, I guess the thing to be aware of is that there's a couple of editions out there, so make sure you don't get one that's too old. And take a look at the changes that have been made since the last time they published the, the study guide. Now one fun thing about the CCNA is that they have a couple of Do You Already Know This quizzes. And so you can take a look at those and see if you feel like you need to study a chapter. We are going to do all the chapters. And uh, in so doing, I guess you, you have to decide how you want to study, right? Do you, want to, do you want to study with available online resources? Do you want to read intently through the book and do a bunch of examples? I am going to go through the chapters one by one, do some examples along the way so that it's not just, you know, book learning. Uh, and remember that there's lots of websites and, and other resources that you might be able to, to look at. In fact, uh, one of the other vendors that I was looking at had their own education software that went along with this. But if you just bought the book and you're in for the, the long run here, let's go get them. So chapter one is the intro to TCP IP networking. And so there's a couple of things that are in there. Now we're just getting started here. So not too much into the weeds and uh, right off the bat in chapter one. So a little TCP IP history little uh, on HTTP and then into the layers of the TCP IP model. The layers of the model are kind of interesting. We will go over that here in a minute. But what we'll find out is that the five layer TCP IP model has a lot to say about most of the layers and not as much to say about others. And then of course the comparison model is the OSI model. So we'll end up talking about that too. Now, if we're looking for the ground truth for all this information, it's easy to look just at the CCNA. But sometimes I like to ask, where did all this information come from, right? What is the ground truth? And so where did these folks that wrote this book get the information for the TCP IP history, right? They didn't just dream it up. So as we get started here, I would like to show you where you can find it as well. So RFCs for the win. It turns out that almost everything that we're going to talk about with regard to protocols and operation and how the Internet does things, those are all in the RFCs. So we're going to make a couple of buckets here. If we are talking about routers and switches and IPv4 and IPv6, all of that stuff is going to exist in the RFCs. The minute we go down to the lower layers and we start talking about local area network protocols, Ethernet, 802.11, right, those are all going to be from a different standards organization, the IEEE. So those are two buckets to sort of think about. In this course, we're going to be much more worried about networking from you know the device perspective and how protocols interoperate so we're not going to worry too much about the ieee but we are going to spend a lot of time with the content out of the internet engineering task force and then another bucket might be all of the stuff that's very very cisco specific right how do you do things on a cisco switch or on a cisco router so those are our sort of buckets all right before we go anywhere, I want to talk about the IETF for a second. They are the managing group for all of the requests for comments. And I'll show you their website here in a second. And then two of the RFCs have all of the rules for the TCP IP model that we're going to talk about here in this chapter. Now, it's a little weird to wrap your head around, right? If you're just getting started on this, you might be asking, well, what in the world is a model? Well, a model is just the structure that we use for the organization of protocols and the operation and the addressing and where devices fit and all of that sort of stuff. Because when it gets right down to it, no single protocol or no single device can do everything. So what we say is things like this. Well, Mac addresses, physical hardware addresses, they'll live 
way down here at layer two. And IP addresses and routing will make that at layer three. And then we'll have some exchange of information between layer two and three. But those protocols and those devices will live just at a particular layer and they won't stray outside of that boundary. So that way we know when we're making a device or writing a protocol that it has a certain set of responsibilities that it has to honor and it doesn't have to worry about things outside of that. So let's take a look at the IETF. Now, the fun part about this is that you can go out to the IETF yourself. You can, I'm just in a browser here, right? So the IETF.org, they're the ones that have all of the information in these documents that we use for networking all the time. And when we start talking about the TCP IP model, two documents that we're going to refer to, at least when we're talking about Chapter uh, 1 here, is RFC 1122 the requirements for internet hosts, the communication layers. This is where we actually define the model. And then requirements for internet hosts, application and support. So what applications are we going to use and what are what are the maybe the responsibilities of those applications? So these are websites that you can actually go to and you can actually do the reading. These automatically become additional resources for you to understand what in the world we're talking about here in chapter Chapter one. Above me here, I've got the five layers that are that are usually described in the TCP IP model. Now those names there are the ones that come right out of the RFC. Now it's very common for other terms to be used interchangeably with some of these names, but I wanted to give you the RFC that shows what the names are as we're talking through this. So what does RFC 1122 have to say? This document is one of a pair that defines and discusses the requirements for host system implementations of the internet protocol suite. So if you are using IPv4 at this time and protocols like UDP and TCP, which we will discuss later on, this RFC gives you sort of the rules for what those protocols and what those layers are going to do. So we've got five layers here, the physical layer and the link layer, sometimes also called the data link layer, are the ones that are at the bottom of our protocol stack, and they're the ones that are typically going to be associated with our local area network protocol, like Ethernet or 802.11. When we move up to the IP layer, also called the network layer, this is where we're going to see IPv4, IPv6, and routing. And then we move up to the transport layer and the application layer at four and five. Now, the transport layer is where we find the transmission control protocol and the user datagram protocol. We'll talk about those uh, later on. Now, this document dates from October 1989, and we still go by this today. Now, as a little bit of history for us here, the Internet was being developed for decades before you know it came to be what we know and love today and at the time there were a collection of companies that all had their own models had their own way of doing things ibm netware from novell they had their own way apple had its own way of doing things but in universities and research centers the protocols that we use to this day were being developed and that is the set of protocols that we see living in these particular documents. The other document that I wanted to point out was RFC 1123. That's this one, Requirement for Internet Hosts. And this is moving us up to the application layer, things that we might want to use. Now, this document actually talks about some of the protocols that were used back in the day, right? Telnet and FTP, uh, DNS and DHCP, those still live today, but we try to avoid using some of uh, some of the protocols that were named here for security reasons they've been been replaced so rfc 1123 says here are the standard protocols that a host connected to the internet must use and the idea was standardization right everybody uses the same thing so we can design systems to deal with certain kinds of applications and we limit the set of problems or the connectivity issues that might arise. And, it in, and RFC 1123 incorporates by reference the RFCs and other documents describing the current specifications for these protocols. So what we have to realize is that when a standard or when a new protocol 
comes about, it inherits all of the rules from all of the other things that came before. So you don't just get to make things up as you go along. We'll see a very, very clear example of that here when we talk about HTTP in a minute. So for each protocol, this document also contains an explicit set of requirements, recommendations, and options. Really, really important the idea there. So everybody's got to do it the same way. This dates also from October 1989. So just for fun, here's the applications that are in there. This is not really part of chapter one, but I thought I would list it here because one of the things that's not mentioned in this particular RFC is HTTP, which is part of chapter one. And that's because at this point in time, we weren't using browsers like we do today. But RFC 2616 does provide all the rules for HTTP or the Hypertext Transfer Protocol. And before we go on here, let's do a little bit of history. Okay, if we look at a lot of the early documentation for the internet, the funding for a lot of that came from DARPA or the Defense Advanced Research Projects Agency. And out of this came ARPANET. So when we look at internet history, if you go out to DARPA.mil, you can actually read some of the history documents out here. So DARPA is a site that has a lot of articles regarding the early internet history, and in particular, the development of the structures that we know today. So we've got funding coming from the Defense Advanced Research Projects Agency. We've got the original creation of ARPANET, which would grow into the internet as we know it today. And then we've got the Internet Engineering Task Force that handles all of these RFCs for us that have all of the rules for all of the protocols that we're going to be studying. All right, so the chapter talks a little bit about the hypertext transfer protocol, which is what we use on our browsers. Actually, today we use the secure hypertext transfer protocol, or HTTPS. But RFC 2616 is sort of the original document, one of the ones that we might look at. So what do we use HTTP for? Well, here is how it's described in, yes, an RFC. The Hypertext Transfer Protocol is an application level protocol for distributed collaborative hypermedia information systems. So the whole idea here is to organize data so they can be presented to a client for display for somebody that's made a request of a web server. Now it has a collection of methods that it uses and error codes and an organized header. What we will find out is that most of the protocols we study at the beginning of each message, there's something called a header. And the header has all of these fields in it that describe exactly what we're trying to do and the information we need to process this information. Now, HTTP uses messages that are in a very familiar format. One of the early applications that we had in the, in the internet was the simple mail transfer protocol. And so the, the way that data was organized and the, the way that data was encoded, you know, ASCII, was described by something called the Multipurpose Internet Mail Extensions, or MIME. Just because we're developing a new protocol, HTTP, that doesn't mean that we stop doing things the way that we did. So HTTP uses data encoded in much the same way that mail did. HTTP is a request response protocol. So what you do is you make a request of the server for, in this case, a web page. It's actually called an HTTP GET, and an HTTP GET is one of the methods that HTTP has. So the client sends a request in the form of a request method and the URI and the protocol version followed by a MIME-like message. Details about the client and you know some, some headers that describe what you're doing. Now that all sounds really, really confusing, at least to me, right? If you were reading that. So here's an actual packet for an HTTP GET. So Again, if we're, we're just getting started here, right? We're just trying to figure this out to get underway here. So here is layer two. There is our ethernet. And here is IPv4. And IPv4 is carrying TCP. And in this case, 
the TCP message is HTTP. And what do we see in HTTP? We see where this came from. We see a little bit of detail about the host itself, right? What kind of browser were you using? What was your operating system? What are the, the kinds of encoding types that you are going to accept? And here we see some character sets, for example, ISO 8859-1 and UTF-8. UTF-8 is extraordinarily common. We see it everywhere. What HTTP is trying to do is trying to establish a connection between two sides and say, this is the data that I would like. Here's the encoding that I'm using. Here's the encoding that I can accept. So when you send it back to me, please adhere to those rules. And by the way, here's the client kind of operating system that I have. Now, there are additional methods that we see in HTTP, but that's not really the point here. The point is that what we have is a very structured protocol that is trying to convey data between the client and the server. At the end of the day, all of our connections are between clients and servers. And what we can also see is that all of these protocols that we're using to carry this information, the TCP or Transmission Control Protocol, that comes from the IETF. The Internet Protocol version 4, that's an IETF. Ethernet Type 2, that's the IEEE. And so that's sort of our boundary. And so as we get more and more familiar with these kinds of protocols and these kinds of ideas, this kind of stuff will become old hat to us. And what we'll learn is how to set all this stuff up and how to manage it and how to look into it. Now, by the way, I suppose before we go, we got to take a look at a quick look at the RFC for HTTP. Now I picked RFC 2616 for a very particular reason. It was the first major update to HTTP. Now the way that you read one of these documents, you can just do a search on your protocol or your topic and then if you add in RFC or IETF, you'll usually get a link for the RFC that you want. But up at the top here, the, what, what we can see is that this particular RFC obsoleted the previous one. It was then updated by all of these other ones, and then, oh no, what we see here is that this RFC was actually obsoleted. And we can follow this chain to find the most recent documents for a particular RFC or a particular protocol. So as we see, we go all the way out, and the RFCs continue to be updated and, and added to. Some things subtracted, some things added, capabilities changed, things like this. And finally, we get all the way to the end of our chain here. And we can see that this one was last updated oops, in June of 2022. So very recent. So the work on these continues to go on uh, even as we're talking right now. So I don't know, was this a good start? Right? It's a very general chapter, trust, trying to get some ideas out there. So what I tried to express to you as we go through the chapter, right, a little bit of history, where this stuff actually comes from, where you can actually read about each protocol that we study. So it's not just about reading through the CCNA book. We have other references that we can use that are sort of the ground truth for this. Now, chapter one has a lot of stuff, so I'm going to go through all of the content probably in a couple of videos. I don't know exactly how long the video should be, right? Uh, maybe we won't go as long. Let me know in the comments if you think that this is too long or about the right uh, length or if we should just sit down and just get through it all. Okay, until the next one, like and subscribe for more CCNA and may those packets always reach their destinations. And I think I'll add certification with a little studying you and i you can do this